Well, thank, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, I want to, again, uh, echo the thanks that other participants have given to the Wilson Center for hosting this event. And uh, I'm just going to wait for like 10 more seconds. I got to have one of my Army colleagues shout at you all. They're very good at that. So yes, I, I, thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting this event. We really appreciate it. And I want to thank especially also Molly John for uh, her great work in leading this organization, the or organizing this initiative. Um, I, uh, you know, recently I've had this just re recurring thing where I always have the slot right before lunch. And, <laughs> and I don't know if you guys know this, but there's, there's actually significant research that shows that judges give harsher sentences in sentencing hearings right before lunchtime. <laughs> so somebody's got it out for me. Like I, I just, uh, so um, I just wanna clarify one thing about our, our study. Uh, Parker did a nice job of talking about it and all the outstanding people who were involved in that. Um, th the, the study really is an independent perspective, uh, just to be clear. It doesn't represent the views of any particular organization in the US government. This is the climate change implications for the United States Army study. There are copies of the executive summary out, out front if you'd like to pick those up. Um, and we've conveniently in included a QR code. We're so modern, right, where you can scan it and get the full PDF online if you'd like to read the full document. But this being Washington, D.C., nobody reads the full document. So, um, the, uh, the, But the study really is an independent perspective. It's a holistic perspective on a very big question, which is, you know, how is the changing climate going to affect the United States Army for the foreseeable future? An impossible question to answer, right? I mean, even if we knew all of the things that it might do to ex explore those in detail is, is impossible. Um, but we, we took a shot at it. And I think our, our approach was informed by a couple of things. One is, what can the army do about these things and if there was nothing for the army to do about a specific implication of climate change we chose not to discuss that very significantly um, the the other thing is that climate change uh, has effects that are both physical and symbolic and by that distinction i, I want to illustrate that distinction with two stories about war i'm on the faculty at the war college although i, I like to describe myself as a slacker anarchist civilian. Like I am, I am not a military person. People thank me for my service sometimes and I have to correct them, right? That was a joke. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, don't thank me for my service. <laughs> um, so physical consequences. Uh, imagine that you are on the frontiers of the Roman Empire at the end of the fourth century AD or uh, CE in the current parlance, um, and all of a sudden you see this vast horde of Goths approaching your outpost. They are rising up against you. Um, this is the nearing, nearing the end of the Western Roman Empire, and, and the Goths are kind of the death knell of the Western Empire. Ultimately, they, they sack Rome at the end of the fourth century, uh, excuse me, at the end of the fifth century CE. But at the end of the fourth century CE, they show up and they become a big problem. They start destabilizing the empire. Why are they here? Like, what's changed? Well, it turns out that there's this other group, the Huns. You may have heard of them, Attila in particular, right? Um, so where, where did they come from? The, the Huns were these people who came from the Asian steppe, probably Kazakhstan. We don't know exactly. They don't have a great written history in their early history. And it, during the fourth century, there was a prolonged period of drought on the steppe. The Huns were a uh, pastoral people, and their animals needed grass to survive. So they left their home territories and started moving west. They were accomplished warriors, and as they moved west, what were they doing? They weren't showing up and asking for permission to use the grasslands of the people who were inhabiting those areas, right? they started just driving these people before them. And ultimately they reach the Eastern part of modern Europe and they're driving the Goths out of their lands. And the Goths are showing up and creating problems for the Romans. And so you have this cascading effect of security problem for the Roman empire that is arising from essentially a, a climatological phenomenon on the steppe. It's a big deal, okay? Um, 
it is it is interesting how nevertheless like when we know in in Sharon's comments earlier about about climate and famine and how war and famine kind of go together it's it's amazing how being a part of a national security institution how seldom we actually talk about these kinds of things as the causes of war or, or reasons to fight and I'm going to kind of come back to that in a bit um the second the second part of this is is about symbols and uh how many of you have been to Gettysburg, the battlefield? Okay. So there was a battle there. You may have heard of it. Um, so th there's this battle in 1863. Uh, and on the second day of the battle, there's a, a place on the field. There's a great monument on Cemetery Ridge to the 1st Minnesota Regiment. And if you know the history of the Battle of Gettysburg, you know that the 1st Minnesota Regiment has this incredible role to play in the battle. And I cannot do better than the great author Shelby Foote in describing this event on the battlefield. So what's happened is, is uh, General Sickles, who's a New Yorker, who was a really incompetent leader, okay, he's put his unit in a, in a difficult position. They're, they're ahead of the line. You don't want to sort of get out of line, essentially, when you're a part of an extended line. They get attacked and routed, creating this gap in the Union line. Uh, General Winfield Scott Hancock, who was a very competent general officer in the Army, he shows up, he sees this gap that this large Confederate force is about to exploit. And, and of course, once a gap is created, if the opponent can get through it, they can sort of roll up your line from the sides. Creates a problem. This is a potentially decisive moment in the battle. So this is the setup, and here's, here's General Winfield Scott Hancock arrives, and he sees this, this regiment, okay? This is a regiment of about 250 guys. And, and he sees charging, like the equivalent of eight of these on the Confederate side are, are approaching. So Hancock, what regiment is this? Hancock asked the officer at the head of the column moving toward him on the slope. First Minnesota, Colonel William Colville replied. Hancock nodded. Colonel, do you see those colors? As he spoke, he pointed to the, at the Alabama flag in the front rank of the charging rebels. Colville said he did. Then take them. Hancock told him. Quickly, although scarcely a man among them could have failed to see what was being asked of him, the Minnesotans deployed on the slope. 262 men present for duty and charging headlong down it, bayonets fixed, stuck the, struck the center of the long gray line of five Confederate regiments. The, the Confederates recoiled briefly, then came on again, yelling fiercely as they concentrated their fire on this one undersized blue regiment. The result was devastating. Colville and all but three of his officers were killed or wounded, together with 215 of his men. A captain brought the 47 survivors back up the ridge, less than one-fifth as many as had charged down it. They had not taken the Alabama flag, but they had held on to their own, and they had given Hancock his five minutes plus five more for good measure. So aside from like an amazing story of heroism, there's something about this that I, I wanna bring to your attention, and that is that um, these people, the Minnesota regiments, and the state regiments, these were volunteers at this stage of the war, all, basically almost all volunteers, from places that had in many ways very little to do with the kind of what we would think of are the causes of the war. And so I'll tell you about one guy in this regiment. His name was Johann George Arnold. So he was from Minnesota, but originally he was from Switzerland. He'd been born in Switzerland in 1837 when he was a teenager. He left Switzerland without his parents and came to the United States. He arrives in uh, 1855, and then two years later, he settles in Minnesota in a town called Stillwater, which was the home of a large community of Swiss. He works in a brewery, okay? In 1861, he hears about this war that's been declared between the, the states, and he enlists. He joins the 1st Minnesota Regiment, so this is the first regiment raised by the state of Minnesota. That regiment fights in many major battles, including 1st Manassas and Antietam prior to its uh, great a great achievement at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but I was thinking about this guy. He went by George, by the way. So I'm thinking about George, right? Born in Switzerland, working in this brewery, right? Why is he there? What, what is it that draws him into this conflict? What does he care about, right? This isn't a physical question for him. It's a symbolic question. It's about union for him. And so... I think it's, it's important for us to understand that when it comes to war, physical things matter and symbols matter. 
Now, how does this connect to the climate change question? So on, on the issue of climate change, in my opinion, okay, while the climatological factors are significant and we should be concerned about them, and in our study we talked about several of those, for example, uh, rising seas, uh, salinization of coastal waters, you know, so loss of basically fresh water supplies and how that affects coastal agriculture and leading to the displace displacement of populations. I mean, this sounds like the Huns, right? Like that kind of a cascading security effect of changing the physical environment. We talk about actually how the physical environment is going to affect the stability of the energy grid and how it, it's going to affect, interestingly, and really fascinating analysis by one of the members of the study, nuclear weapons production in the United States may be imp impacted by climate change. I can't possibly go into the details on that, but it's fascinating. Um, how the climate is opening the Arctic, right? So increasing direct contact between Canada, the United States, and Russia. I don't know. I mean, that might be a problem. Might be, a, might be an opportunity for greater cooperation, but it's certainly something that the U.S. Army has to consider. Um, that's all really fascinating. But then there's this symbolic question of, of climate. So climate change is, in a recent poll, the second most significant national security concern for people in the developed world, globally. Uh, people are worried about it. The planet is not just a thing that keeps us alive, but it is a symbol to which we have affinity. If George Arnold from Minnesota could volunteer to put himself in peril to support this idea of union, right, union, what was that? Like, wh what did it mean to him? What might the safety of the planet mean to people who are interested in mobilizing in its defense. Uh, and if the United States is perceived as an actor that is not mobilizing in its defense, what does that mean to the US military, an organization that we should remind you relies extensively on its allies for stationing its forces and maintaining its global force posture? Uh, a, an example we explore in the piece is the idea that perhaps at some future date, the DOD might face restrictions on its use of fossil fuels. The Army is not prepared to do training when it has significant restrictions on its use of fuel. So how do you prepare for that? How do you anticipate that? Symbols matter, physical effects matter. And in that regard, I think our major contribution to the Army is to keep in mind that whether you want to get into the details of the science or not, if the social environment is such that there is a consensus amongst people with powerful political interests, that this is a problem, it's going to be something that you have to deal with. You can't ignore it. Now, with that, I'm gonna to transition to the panel, and I wanna introduce them. Um, so this is a, a great group. I, first of all, I wanna thank, thank you all for coming. Um, the purpose of this panel is to explore how we think about risk, and, and the previous discussion I think did an awesome job of setting this up, but how we think about risk in complex systems. And so on the panel, I have sort of somebody representing what I think is a really interesting complex system. You'll note that there's significant overlap, that's great. The purpose of the panel is to have a discussion about how you think about that risk. Each person will have an opportunity to speak about his or her own system, and then we're gonna have a kind of guided discussion as a full group during the second half of the panel and ideally open it up to some questions from the floor. Um, with that in mind, uh, so I wanna introduce this great group. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Dave, David Wade. David is currently the Director of Medical Preparedness in the Resilience Policy Directorate of the National Security Council. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, and so I wanna thank him for accepting an invitation from a representative of an Army institution. Um, you guys are still ahead in the Army-Navy game, even though you know, like last couple of years, we kind of turned around a little bit, but we got a long ways to go after losing, what, 13 in a row or something, I can't remember. Um, but Dave, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's outstanding to have a representative from the NSC. Second, Dr. Ardith Grills, Ardith. Uh, she is the Associate Director for Innovation, Development, Education, and Analytics, which has the amazing acronym IDEA, right? Like, I, I, I work for DOD, and we love acronyms, but we are, that's, that's really a good one. Um, <laughs> At, and she's in the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at the Centers of Disease Control. She has a doctorate in Emerging Infectious Diseases. Uh, Dr. Dustin Brisson, here to my left, he is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Pennsylvania. 
uh, and his research explores important questions in disease ecology and evolution. And so I think we have several representatives on the panel. I think you have a great perspective on, on the kind of nexus between e e ecology, the e ecological system, public health, disease, and so on. Uh, Dr. Frank O'Sullivan, he's the director of research at the MIT Energy Initiative, and he has deep expertise in unconventional oil and gas resources and also has a really great accent, so you'll enjoy listening to him. Um, and finally, uh, Mr. Dennis Lockhart. So Dennis is a professor at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. He's also, interestingly and crucially to his presence here, he's the former president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And he served in that capacity during the financial crisis, uh, its subsequent deep re recession and then recovery. So when um, Dr. Schoonover was talking about the significance of uncertainty and surprise, Mr. Lockhart's well-versed in both of those, right? <laughs> but he's, he's also uh, a friend of my father's from way back in the day from Citibank. Uh, so thank you, Dennis, for being here. Uh, thank you all. And so to, to start the panel, um, I'm going to sit down. So I will not stand here the whole time, but I, I wanted to just describe what, what we asked them to talk about, okay? So each panelist is going to talk for about five minutes. Uh, and I asked them to speak to two questions, which are totally easy to cover in five minutes. That was sarcastic. So first one was important types of risk. So what are the important types of risk in, in the system of which you're an, an expert? And, and the second is, how do you effectively manage those risks? And what are the limits of risk management? And, and so the first part, we're gonna ask them to talk about those. And then in the subsequent discussion, we're gonna look to kind of integrate these perspectives and see how we can apply them to the food system, thinking about that as a system that requires risk management. Uh, we will start actually with, with Mr. Lockhart and then Mr. O'Sullivan, and then just to change things up, we'll move to Dustin because you were expecting me to continue that way. Uh, then Dr. Grills and finally Dr. Wade, and then we'll transition to the group discussion. Thank you. Well, good, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the banking and financial system um, and what parallels we can find between that and food uh, security. So let me start with the point that the financial system, and, and I should say that in the United States, uh, our financial system is made up today almost uh, equal parts banking and non-banking, or non-bank institutions and markets. So it's really a mixed system, and there are differences in terms of regulatory oversight as well as uh, visibility or opacity uh, in various aspects of that system. But the financial system is, is a truly global system, um, and it is prone to uh, contagion, to um, cascading events, uh, to compounding uh, problems, uh, and the governance of that system is highly fragmented. So that may sound familiar to many of you in the room in your particular domains. Uh, I thought I would set up a contrast between what I know about the food system and food security and then look at the financial system. So if you think of, of, of food and, and food uh, supply chains, there, there's a weather dependency, a, an aspect of perishability that is perhaps even somewhat unique to uh, food. As mentioned in the earlier presentation, at least three levels of activity, production, uh, processing, and packaging, and distribution. Uh, processing is prone to hazards of various kinds, which are technical in nature. A and uh, finally, distribution is highly complex with first order distribution and then second order distribution. At the end of my remarks, I'm gonna just tell you a couple anecdotes from a visit this week to a food bank uh, in, um, in, in Atlanta. The financial system is uh, inherently fragile. It's built into, in a way into the structure of how financial systems work. One of the principal roles of a banking or financial system is what's called maturity transformation. That is, taking your short-term deposits and investing those in long-term assets. Uh, 
and that works until it doesn't because it creates a, a liquidity problem in financial institutions when there is a call on those uh, deposits or those short-term liabilities uh, while you have illiquid long-term assets. It is a highly leveraged system in the sense of financial leverage. The banking system in the United States leveraged basically 12 to 1. Prior to the financial crisis, non-banks were uh, at least first order leverage was as high as 35 or 40 to 1. And then that gets compounded by investments in derivative kinds of instruments that uh, are, it's very hard to compute, but basically they compound the level of, of leverage. The financial system is based on trust and confidence. And when that trust erodes and erodes rapidly, you can end up with a financial crisis as, as we saw in 2008. And then finally, um, I, I, we tend to focus on institutions, and that is institutional players in the system, but also there uh, are uh, important roles for, for markets that have literally millions of participants in those markets. And uh, again, we, we learned in the financial crisis of a decade ago that we needed to not only support institutions, but support markets and interventions from uh, regulators. Um, so if you think of a systemic meltdown or a systemic crisis, sort of what parallels can I, can I draw? The, the law for, for well over 100 years, the concern of financial regulators has been runs runs on individual institutions, and what we learned a decade ago is runs on financial markets. Uh, you can have runs at the retail level, that's the classic image, uh, uh, in, you know, in, uh, uh, in movies and so forth of the small town banker trying to talk people out of t withdrawing their deposits from the bank, that's our classic image. What happened a decade ago was runs on the wholesale market, which is a collection of markets and, and uh, institutions. Uh, runs uh, can reflect, uh, and, and I would say that runs in the food system might be roughly akin to hoarding and profiteering. Uh, that is to say, you know, t taking an uh, undue proportion of uh, the foodstuffs that are available for the for the population. Uh, runs can reflect uh, uh, panic, and uh, often you see compounding and quite unpredictable human behavior uh, in a financial panic. Uh, and again, I think one of the concerns in the food system would be the human behavior that, that results in some form of panic of a populace in, in an affected area. Uh, illiquidity uh, may be roughly akin to perishability, and that is to say uh, illiquidity of financial institutions is when they uh, suddenly cannot uh, meet their obligations based upon the liquidity of the assets they've invested in. I touched on that a little bit earlier. The financial system is a network of counterparty relationships which involves counterparty risks, uh, meaning uh, what is the condition of the party you're doing business with? And, and again, we learned how difficult it is to map this when there are first order relationships and then your counterparty has counterparties and they have counterparties. And that uh, the weakness of a link in that chain can cascade uh, to become a full-blown financial uh, problem or a financial crisis. And, uh, and as I said, uh, the financial system is prone to contagion when something goes wrong at the speed of clicks. So participants in the financial markets who get scared uh, can basically click their way out of a, an exposure, and that can, uh, can be a tremendous accelerant to uh, what happens you know, in a financial crisis. Well, we don't really need to theorize too much because uh, 10 years ago we had a full-blown financial crisis. And actually, Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, and Hank Paulson have just uh, two or three weeks ago published a book which is a 10-year look back at what uh, 
happened during that period. And on the plane up last night, I, I was reading their book. A lot of it's familiar to me because I, I, I lived part of that history. Um, but there were some lessons from that financial crisis that they – uh, they point to that may have relevance to our look here at, f at food security. Uh, first, early recognition. It is extremely difficult to recognize what exactly is going on at the beginning uh, of um, a crisis. Um, the agencies involved who are going to be expected to react need a tool bag uh, and at the same time need inevitably an ability and authority, legal authority, to improvise. Uh, and maybe somewhat unique to financial systems is the notion of moral hazard, and that is if you react quickly and you bail out participants, then you have changed the incentives uh, system for, or, or incentive structure for what you would call prudent behavior. So, uh, ironically, a quick intervention in a nascent financial crisis can teach participants that they'll be bailed out and so they can take more risks than they uh, normally would take because uh, the Federal Reserve or someone will come to the rescue. rescue. Uh, the financial crisis taught us about the importance of communication, um, and communication to explain the policy uh, actions that are taking place and also to try to quell some of the misinformation that often occurs in the midst of panic. Um, and I think that directly relevant to what might happen in an operational theater dealing with some kind of a, a food-related uh, crisis. When panic uh, actually sets in. There is a psychology uh, of the moment. And one of the big lessons of uh, 2008, um, 2007 and 8 is don't incrementalize when panic sets in. You, um, uh, you have to go after the problem with uh, shock and awe, to use a term familiar to this audience, and, and overpower it so that in the minds of people who are affected by the panic, uh, it changes basically their view of what's going to happen. Uh, and it moves them from fe fear to some degree of confidence that things are going to, do, to be all right. So I think that's one of the major uh, lessons that we learned from, from that period. There are prevention methods. Uh, th this would be keys to risk management, as Andrew asked that we discuss. Uh, the capital base uh, of the f banking system uh, is roughly akin to a, a resilience, uh, uh, call it uh, resilience reserves. Um, the banking system is regulated, uh, but not all participants in the financial system are regulated to the same degree. Uh, they are regulated along the lines of liquidity, Diver, uh, diversification, which is the deconcentration of risk um, and risk management processes. And part of that now is stress testing, which I think is a methodology that we could, could conceivably, once you've got a reasonable grasp on the dynamics of a, of a food uh, supply chain, uh, could be uh, applied. One of the lessons of 2008 is that tail risks, black swans, actually do, from time to time, happen. And uh, so stress testing, in, in the case of banks, with a very adverse set of economic assumptions, is uh, now it's a, it's a regular feature of risk management. And then uh, tabletop exercises is another method that the Federal Reserve used, particularly focused on payment systems, the plumbing, if you will, of the retail or consumer uh, access to goods, services, foodstuffs, and so forth, uh, looking at the potential for cyber attacks, for example, on the payment system. Um, how modelable is, all, is the financial system, and therefore how modelable is the food security system? Uh, I have to be very cautious in, in stating that we, we, 
can model something as complex. It's global. It's got multiple uh, parties involved, multiple instruments. I always used models, uh, uh, macroeconomic models, as tools to inform uh, judgment, but not necessarily giving answers in themselves. I attended a conference out at Stanford on a monetary policy conference just uh, uh, the, earlier this month, and there was a presentation on essentially an assembly of 120 different macroeconomic models that are tracked for their predictive ca capacity. So that gives you an idea of how much reliance on a single model uh, macroeconomists are prepared to uh, to uh, make these days. So they, if you have 120 of them, maybe you can, in on average, get to an answer of what might happen. So Dennis, like maybe final remarks. Okay, um, I just want to make uh, two final uh, comments. One. We learned a lot from Katrina, which I think could, might very well be analogous to an operational theater abroad or domestically in a food security crisis. Uh, there was a breakdown of the payment system. Essentially, in Katrina, people went from ATMs to lack of cash to barter, basically. So you went to fundamental ways of, of getting access to food and water. Uh, people were moving, so the uh, putting remedies into where they were was irrelevant when people were migrating and moving, and I think Artis will talk mm -hmm. a, a little bit about that. And there was very poor coordination of responders. Federal Reserve people who were trying to get cash to people so they could buy food and water uh, were looked at cross-eyed by FEMA who had never heard of the Federal Reserve and had no idea of what we were there to do in, in that crisis. Uh, finally, just in uh, my visit earlier this week uh, to a food bank in Atlanta, the Atlanta Community Food Bank, they talked a lot about urban variability and, so, and, and I think uh, food security is an urban, is gonna have an urban, urban dimension to it and uh, with any, in, in, in a steady state, within any given urban area, there is enormous variability of food security today. Atlanta is about six million people, 785,000 are viewed as food insecure. And the second point was, you need to think in terms of different demographic groups, children and elderly are more vulnerable in a food insecure situation than, um, than maybe just uh, pure adults. And finally, distribution points are quite unconventional when you think of the second layer of food distribution to the poor, uh, to the food insecure in an urban environment, using churches and other institutions that you would not conventionally think were part of the system. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Frank? So thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Andrew, for the invitation. Um, so when Andrew asked me to come and, come and make some remarks with respect to risk in the context of energy systems, uh, you know, I was taken, taken aback slightly because it really is an enormous, enormously complex topic. And so from the point of view of my remarks here, I think to be kind of try and make them tangible, I'm going to limit myself somewhat to, to the power system uh, rather than the broader energy system. Um, and the power system is particularly interesting from, uh, from the point of view of risk and considering risk um, for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that it is uh, probably the most complicated machine on Earth. So it, from a technical point of view, it is a uh, remarkably complex system. Um, but on top of that is layered the fact that um, it is vital um, for human well-being at the, at the broadest possible sense, a huge driver of the economy, um, a, and an enabler, a uh, key enabler of national security. Uh, and it does all of this, crucially, with perhaps the most exquisite supply chain ever created. So um, to date, for more than 100 years, 
this system has operated without effectively any storage, uh, any short-term storage broadly available. We have had to rely on uh, the grid to uh, meet supply and demand effectively instantaneously. And, uh, and therefore, you know, when you step back and you look at a system like that, um, you know, I think most people are really surprised at how robust and effective it has proven to be over the years. Um, in the United States, we don't actually just have one system. We have three machines. Um, we have what's called the Eastern Interconnection, the Western Interconnection, and then, of course, Texas is its own interconnection. Uh, <laughs> um, um, but those, within those systems, so here in, uh, here in D.C., for example, we're within uh, the Eastern Interconnection, uh, every generator uh, that's generating power, all this electricity, every machine is exactly synchronized. So they are synchronized, generating at, uh, at the same phase instantaneously. And that's really, really remarkable. So when we step back and we begin to consider risk and risk structure across that particular machine, we, we really have to start there at the kind of the technical basis. But we also have to consider multiple layers uh, of risk at the uh, commercial level and at the regulatory level and so on. And to add to that, uh, to that complexity, we also have a situation today where the system itself, its fundamental fabric, is changing very profoundly. Um, it's changing in a manner um, that uh, really over the next 10 or 15 years will utterly reshape how, uh, how electricity services are provided. And, and along with that, how we think about risk uh, is, is evolving. We see both opportunities to mitigate risk and we see a whole host of new risks that are beginning to emerge. Um, so there are many parallels here uh, with respect to the, the energy water nexus with respect to the food and water nexus with respect to food and climate nexus and so on and so forth and we'll, we'll draw that out in a little bit uh, a little bit later I'm sure but um, I just want to spend a little bit of time diving into some of the specific technical and uh, commercial risks that uh, we currently face with respect to the electricity system and then speak a little bit about how how they're evolving and how we're looking to mitigate them and so on so first on the technical side, so as I said, we have a system that uh, operates in a very delicate balance. And that system has a value chain that is essentially made up of four, four elements. So we have generation, the generation component of the system. We have high voltage transmission, so the grid, as people think about it, the large pylons. We have the distribution system, so the real network that wires every individual building together. And then finally, we have end use and the customer, the so-called behind the meter world. Um, and uh, across that entire spectrum, each one of those have their own physical vulnerabilities, have their own commercial vulnerabilities, and so on and so forth. Um, what's most interesting at the moment for this system, uh, from a technical point of view, as I said, is that there is now a new suite of technologies beginning to be introduced to the system. So I speak about things like intermittent renewables that alter in a very fundamental way um, the technical challenge of maintaining that system uh, within the kind of operational profile that it requires. So historically, we have relied on uh, generation plants, coal, nuclear, fire, uh, nuclear powered plants, gas fired plants, and so on, which have dispatchable uh, capacities or capabilities. So as demand varies, we can basically turn the throttles up and down in order to ensure that we balance supply and demand. With intermittent renewables, Things are changing. Uh, you, you basically have to deal with the power when you get it. And when you don't get it, you need to somehow uh, meet the balance of demand with some other resource. Now, at the moment, um, the relative role of these intermittent re uh, resources on the system is, is I would say, modest uh, for the most part. Instantaneously, it can be significantly larger in places. Um, but we are moving, uh, inevitably, towards a situation where these resources are going to play a much larger role. And that's not because of climate change policies, trying to address climate change and so on. That is because today, in the United States, the lowest cost mechanism for delivering a megawatt hour of electricity, of new capacity to the system, is in building wind or solar facilities. Um, so because of the way the business of electricity is structured, because of the way investment decisions are made, 
um, those plants are being rolled out. And as those plants are rolled out, we have to really begin to think carefully about how do we ensure that the system is able to effectively integrate those new resources and their new operating uh, capabilities into, into the grid to ensure reliability, robustness, resiliency, and so on. Um, I think we're at a point today in achieving that goal um, that, that's really not very satisfactory. Um, and the reason for that is that um, though we have one singular machine in the, uh, in the Eastern Interconnect, for example, we have literally hundreds of individual kind of layers of regulatory oversight and so on, both technically and from a, from a, from a policy point of view, um, that shape this. And um, we have not yet managed to fully align, I think, across uh, all of those layers in a manner that integrates well with the changing physical nature of the system. Uh, we're going to have to do more and more of that. And so there are agencies um, that are kind of tasked with looking at the machine itself, looking at what is required technically, and then providing guidance to the kind of the regulatory layers above that to ensure that enough capacity is in place, that we're making investments in the right types of technologies where they're needed and so on. Um, but that really remains a, uh, a, you know, a, uh, a process that is, uh, is far from complete. And uh, indeed, I think it's a process that's maybe falling behind because what we're seeing is an acceleration in the deployment of these new technologies, both at the generation and, and indeed increasingly at the, at the distribution side of the system um, and at the end use side of the system. That acceleration in technology deployment is not being met by kind of an acceleration of the fit for purposeness of the, of the, of the regulatory layers. It's a big risk that we're trying to contend with today and we're gonna to have to do, do more to um, uh, more work in that respect. Now, with all of that said, the technologies that are being rolled out, um, they have their benefits. So, um, you know, I mentioned wind and solar. There are some drawbacks there. The benefits are that it reduces fuel security risks in many respects. Um, it certainly reduces environmental impact uh, risks. And indeed, particularly for solar, you have now the opportunity to deploy in a very large scale distributed generation. And by being able to push distributed generation into the system, onto the grids, you alter fundamentally the structures of the value chain in a way that, if appropriately uh, coordinated, can actually aid resiliency. So, you know, speaking to uh, more significant uh, weather events and so on and so forth, uh, there's now a lot of focus amongst users in terms of adding robustness and resiliency to their individual energy supplies, to their individual electricity supplies. And these new technologies do provide a mechanism for, uh, a mechanism for achieving that. Um, as I said, again, the challenge there is can that be achieved in a coordinated manner uh, across the various layers uh, and across the various stakeholders of the system? Um, uh, just just yep. one final point then on the commercial side. Great. Um, so on the commercial side, um, what we've had for managing risk over, over you know, decades now have been financial, financial products, hedges and so on and so forth, and market structures. And they've worked very well in delivering a very cost-effective solution in terms of energy and electricity services uh, to this country. Uh, the electricity system today, for example, will deliver you energy at 1,000th the cost of the equivalent kind of battery that you would buy at, buy at the store, for example. So the electricity that we receive is an incredibly cheap commodity, and that has been made possible by having kind of an exquisitely complex and effective set of commercial layers on top of the physical system. We are also now having to though, evolve those systems in order to better, uh, better fit and better mesh with the changing technical nature of the system. So uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yes. All right. So I, so I really appreciate being here. This is quite a different um, group than I than I usually interact with. Um, but that saying, but saying that, I, I've been really impressed um, with the sort of systems approach thinking that I've I've seen in the in the previous panel and in this panel, which is the way that I usually approach things as well. Um, so I usually look at the the way that uh, pathogens or parasites affect ecological communities or populations. <laughs> And that, that really is sort of this, this network approach, just like we saw in the, in the last panel that was discussed 
quite a bit. So I, but I really just look at sort of the, the biological system. So the way that I, I see risk to a large degree is how do perturbations of areas of a network affect the system as a whole? Um, and to manage risk is effectively, can you predict how any particular perturbation will affect some other part, part of the system? Um, I should say that, that one of the impressive parts um, that I've seen so far today is that you know, th there is this kind of tendency <coughs> towards simplicity. You, you take a system and you try to identify individual parts that seem important and then focus on those individual parts repeatedly um, and only look at, at the direct effects on those, those focal parts. Um, and I feel like this group at least has gone the opposite direction, which I, I, I believe to be the correct direction, uh, and that is keeping the entire system in perspective a, as, you, as you work through it, not just focusing on, on individual parts. And the reason I think that's particularly important, and we see that quite a bit in uh, ecological systems, is that the parts are, are highly interconnected and there's very often higher order effects. So you affect one system and there's not a direct impact um, on something that you might care about, but several higher order uh, compounding effects, which can be multiplicative. And in that way, you can have a really drastic effect on one aspect of the system that doesn't seem connected to, to the perturbation in some other part of, of the system. Um, I should also point out that a lot of what I had planned to say was repeated uh, in, the first, in the first part of the panel, so I'm gonna keep my, my comments relatively short um, I hope, relatively short. Um, what, I can, what I can say though, um, or what I'd like to, to point out is for us, for, for managing um, risk in an ecological context is really about information and knowledge, which was also brought up in the previous panel. So the more we know about how things are interconnected and what are the, the direct but also higher order effects will allow us to, be, to predict how anything could happen. And, um, while the systems might be quite complex, when you know, you don't have to know everything, but when you know quite a bit, the systems are actually quite predictable in context. So that is, as long as you know all of the players or a lot of the players, you can pretty well predict things, um, how, how any particular perturbation might affect anything. Uh, we've seen that with a, with a number of, of systems and this is something that we do uh, quite a bit where we take even, uh, moderate predictions of future climate or landscape uh, effects and can relatively well predict how any particular system might change given those uh, respects or those, those changes. The biggest concern that I see uh, on the ecological side is the addition or removal of nodes of these networks, so, in, so populations or species from these networks. The reason for that is most of these interactions are context specific. So the way that uh, any two interactions occur within a system depends on the entire context and they can <coughs> change in sign as well as in, um, uh, in magnitude given the different context. So it's really difficult to predict how things will happen if you add an entirely new thing to the network, it can change that network in its entirety or to, to, to a large degree. Um, so just a couple of, of points that I, I just, I think I want to drive home. Uh, one is the context, uh, context dependency, which I, I just meant, I just mentioned. Um, one other thing is we've been talking a lot about climate change, but it, for, um, in my perspective, it's really about habitat change that includes climate change, but also a lot of the, the different ways that the habitat is changing, um, and so it's not only about just, just the climate, but these are interconnected uh, features. I mentioned that um, these ecosystems are often quite predictable, and that tends to be true in the biological systems. The one thing that is completely unpredictable, at least as far as I can tell, are humans and human behaviors. Um, <laughs> once you interject that, I have no idea what to do. Humans always seem to do the opposite of what is, seems logical, um, which is frustrating um, from, from, from a modeling perspective, but it is, um, 
probably interesting, and it, this is where I think the main complexity or the main um, the main difficulties come in is how humans will actually do things. So uh, I just want to bring one um, I think I think illustrative example of um, the way that I think about things, and also the different the prediction or the capacity to predict things, and and um, well, not so much the human part, but the rest of it. So this is the mosquito fish example in California. So, so California um, gave out mosquito fish uh, to control mosquitoes was the idea. So mosquito fish, in theory, eat uh, mosquito larvae. And so if you put mosquito fish into systems, you would expect that uh, mosquito levels should drop. What ended up happening was that mosquito fish prefer to eat um, amphibian eggs, frog eggs, for example. And so in some systems where frogs are not particularly uh, important, there, aren't not, there are not very many uh, frogs, adding mosquito fish to these systems did, in fact, reduce mosquito levels quite well. In most of the natural systems, though, where, uh, where the mosquito fish were introduced into, say, native streams, they killed all of the frogs, not all of them, they killed most of the frogs, and mosquito levels actually rose. Now, this is something that's actually quite predictable if you know that mosquito fish will eat frog eggs, but that is the context. This, con this stream ecology context is that there are frogs, and you would not necessarily know ahead of time that the mosquito fish will eat frog eggs. So, in context, it is predictable. Out of context, prediction becomes quite difficult. The last thing I want to say, and this is sort of off the topic, but this is um, a, a practical point. Um, I think in order to, to mitigate risk most effectively, it's important to get the, uh, the interests of the players who are involved aligned. If you can get everyone to, to be incentivized to um, cooperate, if it is in their best interest to, to play well, you're much more likely to be successful than um, if it's a pure competition system where the incentives are to, to cheat, to get the most out of this system yourself. That is not the ecology part of it, but that, um, that is what I've seen to be um, important. Thank you. Arda. All right. So um, I'm going to draw on, I think I've got something from everyone here that they've mentioned, um, and I'm going to take a step back. So we're here to talk about food. We're humans, and people consume food. That's the base reason why we're actually here. Uh, in epidemiology, we try and boil every complicated thing down to the epidemiologic triangle, the strongest structure um, as a shape. And in epi, those three corners are agent, host, and environment. So agent is really anything that is the what you would perturb in your system um, and it is looked at hopefully inherently whole as a system um, and in this context foods that system but you need to know about those other two angles and so my group at CDC um, our division is dedicated to that knowing that population on the move we do it every single day at various different scales. Yesterday, I took a flight. I then hopped on the metro. Today, I took an Uber. You all did very much the same at various different scales. And we do this a lot. Um, so much so that I'm gonna read some of these facts just so that you can understand why this is such a risky engagement. We have uh, 4.6 billion passengers on scheduled flights in 2019, commercially scheduled flights. Um, for the United States alone, half a million people arrive from international destinations every single day. That's 120 million people coming into the United States. In fiscal year 2018, Customs and Border Protection, right next door, 
process 700,000 people every single day coming across a land border. So that's just the context of that movement. Now interject into that space a vulnerable population and a population that's not only vulnerable for their own inherent being human and having individual factors contributing to that vulnerability, but also then communicable disease. So everybody who takes the metro and knows that it's really just a rocket ship to the flu and the cold, um, you know what I'm talking about. Every day this week, there has been news articles about our sad, sad uh, situation with measles going on right now. We have a currently uncontrolled outbreak of Ebola in an insecure location that the U.S. government cannot physically go into to help try and stop. These are all vulnerabilities, and the agent of that disease is humans on the move. So what do we do about controlling this vulnerable situation. So the good thing is the fact that people are really just disease vectors has been long known. So the word quarantine actually dates back to 14th century Venice, where they would hold ships, international ships, coming in at anchor for 40 days before they were allowed to enter the city. The sailors either died and they check the box, or they were allowed to come in after 40 days. So that concept of isolating a population and keeping them away from everybody else is really the cornerstone of what the modern day quarantine service does at CDC. My division also, in addition to running these 18 quarantine stations to control the introduction and transmission of disease within the United States, also works with refugees and immigrants. So numbers around that, we're at a banner year for immigrants and refugees. The number is up to 258 million immigrants. And these are migrants who move either short term, uh, like migrant farm workers, uh, students going to a school in a different country, or permanent migrants, regardless of their status, moving to a new country. On the refugee side, these are the internationally recognized refugees who are leaving their, or are outside their country of origin for reasons of persecution, violence, other internationally protected and recognized classes. There are 69 million of them right now. Um, and the United States has always been the lead acceptant of immigrants and refugees. Um, currently, right now, Turkey's got us beat. They're holding 3.1 million refugees right now um, in their country and struggling to do so. So these are big, big numbers. So how do we protect on that vulnerability? So with the migrant population, they run the gamut of what could be vulnerable about them. Refugees, we assume, because of the conditions from which they are fleeing from, that they have health circumstances that we need to rectify and make them a healthy population. Long ago, the US government recognized this and instilled in HHS through the Public Health Service Act regulatory authority that's been invested at CDC. To point out why this is rare, there are only two entities at CDC that actually have regulatory authority we have, in my division, one of those. We actually implement three different regulations, interstate quarantine, inter foreign quarantine, and then the third one is the uh, medical examination of foreign aliens. What this program does is basically look at people overseas, determine that they are not a risk, bring them up to a level that we can consider that they would not necessarily be a risk to the US population, and then bring them in, take all that we know about them, and give it to our state and local partners. So you see it's this surround of being able to ensure, one, that we have corrected whatever was vulnerable about them, and then place them into the complex network of the United States and maintain that resilience that we've now instilled in them.
But beyond our own U.S. context, which is both historic and actually fairly robust, there's also the international authority that comes down from the United Nations to the World Health Organization through the international health regulations. And the very first line in, that, uh, in those regulations state that there are specific measures at ports, airports, and ground crossings to limit the spread of health risks to neighboring countries and to prevent unwarranted travel and trade restrictions so that tra traffic and trade disruption is kept to a minimum. So there is that um, ensuring that everybody's good to go, but also restricting us a little bit. You can't just go and say, nah, disease, closing the border. Um, one, it doesn't work. But two, if you're signatory to the IHRs, which the majority of the world is signatory to, it also means that you may be restricting travel and trade um, and that's not something that's frowned upon or is frowned upon. So we look at these in this massive international context to try and make sure that people on the go can do so safely and healthy. Next. Thank you. Very All right, I guess, I guess I'm next. These things are on? Yep. Okay. Anyway, I'm Dave Wade and I'm from the National Security Council. Uh, by training, I'm a surgical oncologist, and it sort of affects how I do my job. Surgical oncology is a subdivision of general surgery, and there are several groups of surgeons in that. Trauma surgeons who love surprises, it's their life, <laughs> and surgical oncologists who are the other end of that spectrum who hate surprises. Um, <clears throat> and so when I was a, a, an active surgeon and training surgical residents, one of the things that I would do with them as we went through preparing for intra-abdominal cancer surgery is essentially try to minimize risk by doing what they teach at the war colleges when you do operational planning is that you do branches and sequels. If this happens, we'll do that. If that happens, we'll do this so that you get in there and you're not basically in crisis decision mode because you had failed to plan uh, before you got in there. And that's good for me as I approach my duties uh, at the National Security Council because that's kind of how that works. And um, I'll get into that in just a minute. A lot of people don't know what the NSC is. I mean, you, you recognize the people on TV, John Bolton's a National Security Advisor and that sort of stuff, but you don't really realize that he runs a staff. He runs a staff of about 320 people, most of whom basically work for the federal government. In fact, they all pretty much have to because you have to have a top secret security clearance and be a government employee to actually work there. But they're borrowed labor from the departments and agencies throughout the federal government. So only about 10% of the NSC are permanent staff of the NSC. The other 90% are people that come for a year or two of duty to basically work on, on issues to try to solve national security problems or, or risk. And the beauty of that, and it's kind of inspiring in the sense when you actually get to see that work, is that there's a lot of people throughout the government that truly are subject matter experts. They're running around at the GS 14, 15 level who have master's of, or doctoral degrees who are really very smart about their particular niche of what they do. And some of the folks who are up here are seeing that. And the power of the NSC when it approaches problem solving is not that we can compel departments and agencies to do things. We don't have that statutory authority. Our only authority is to really to make people come to meetings. So when we say <coughs> we have a problem and we're going to round up the interagency to address that issue, we can sort of strong arm the departments and agencies, including my mm -hmm. colleague sitting right to my left, to actually come to meetings to help us solve problems. And in that process, what you do is try to find the best solutions, policy options that then get ratcheted up the chain of command from the subject matter experts to assistant secretary level, the deputy secretary level, to the secretary levels of, uh, of the departments and agencies. 
And if all of that meets in concurrence, then we have new policy that affects national security. And so I just wanted to sort of give you that background on, on how that works. Um, and the way that we sort of do it, and the reason I got on this panel, is food and agriculture defense is part of my portfolio. Now, you would wonder why on earth is a surgical oncologist doing that? Uh, it, it's just I got the job. The, the, the portfolio <laughs> comes with the territory, and so uh, you better get used to it. But one of the things that I started to do, I've been there now for about five, six months, is is since this is part of my portfolio is to actually look at that and we have a lot of vulnerabilities uh, related to food and agriculture and we've heard that I think throughout this morning I'm not going to go into too much detail on that one of the things that we have done is we start to basically compel departments and agencies to come and help us solve these problems and looking at defensive food and, and agriculture is we sort of come to realize that it's not just food and ag, we got to drag water in there. So when we actually at the NSC talk about defense of food and agriculture, it's defense of food, agriculture, and water because without the water, you're not going to be doing agriculture or food. Uh, and so that's part of how we do that. Um, our approach to sort of risk management, again, is something that you find right out of the war colleges. Uh, when they do what they call risk matrix tables, and you've all seen those, you may not have realized what it is. It's essentially uh, probability tables on one axis, low probability, high probability, consequence on the other axis, which is you know low consequence, high consequence. And when you look at a problem to try to solve it, you can't reduce risk to zero. It's simply, it's not possible in the military and it's probably not possible in the food ag business. What you have to do is make those compromises as you look at that consequence uh, uh, probability matrix and say, realistically, what can we do from not only a financial standpoint and trying to mitigate risk because finances come into that decision-making process, but also understanding, especially in food ag in the United States, the vast, the overwhelming majority of that capability in our system is in the private sector. And we don't have a, a command-directed economy. You know, well, this, is, this is a republic and, and people have freedom. So we can advise, we can sort of compel through the regulatory processes of the FDA, USDA, and, uh, and EPA. We can sort of make it favorable for people to do what we think is the right thing. But in the bottom line, we're in a free society. And so we can't really compel that to too much. And I'm going to kind of complete my comments to you folks by just asking you to think about some things you may not be aware of. We're talking mostly my job is national security, which is homeland security, but it also has that international flavor. We've talked about Ebola over in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We do not want that disease in America. We had that experience three or four years ago, and it was pretty crippling considering the fact that we treated, what, four people? Mm -hmm. I think that's how many we treated. Yep. Very disruptive to to our routine medical processes, including border screenings at aerial ports of embarkation. Um, but a couple of things to consider. How many of you know what African swine fever is? Oh, we have some people, good. So you probably know that they're having a little struggle over in Southeast Asia right now with that. Another disease that we do not want in America. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a struggle as I have watched what's happened with African swine fever over the last five or six months in China, Vietnam, and now Laos is I'm just amazed how many people smuggle sausages um, <coughs> because the countries around there are clearly do not want African swine fever in their country. So they are doing a lot of port of entry, both ground, sea, and air inspection of people coming from China or Vietnam or Laos. And it's amazing how many people basically smuggle sausages in their luggage, <laughs> and which they, they get caught. And then, of course, they test it, and it's positive for African swine fever. And so, so then pleasant unpleasantries ensue. So um, it's just amazing. But those are the sorts of things that are uh, of a concern and certainly caused my and my colleagues in the interagency 
you know, to have a little loss of sleep at night. For those of you that were wondering, USDA is very aware of this issue, and they are starting initiatives now to try to keep African swine fever out of America through our aerial and maritime ports of entry. But again, that's one of those sorts of risk. Another thing to think about is how many people know what CRISPR technology is? Oh, gosh, you guys are really... That is something that is essentially... Uh, all about genetically modified foods. We think about it in terms of treating diseases, which is a good thing, but it is, is equally big in the plant world in terms of genetic, genetically modified foods. And an interesting thing about that is this is evolving technology. Everybody wanna kinda wants to get to race to the front so they can have it. Um, about 15 years ago, I lived in Great Britain. I lived there for two years, so I'd listen to the BBC down in my kitchen. And I was amazed when I was there that, boy, in Europe, they really didn't like genetically modified foods. They would get sort of raven at the mouth about this in terms of anger and, and that sort of stuff on their talk shows and that. So it was clearly like, wow, these people are really deadly serious about that. And of course, the great evil was Monsanto because they were the company that was into GMO business back then. You know, about a year ago, Germany, a company in Germany bought Monsanto. So, hmm, what's going on there? And so as you think about CRISPR technology and genetically modified foods, just think about how the world may turn, some of what you said about ecosystems. So uh, there's that business out there. And the last thing I'm going to uh, finish my comments on is uh, the potential adverse of cyber actors in the food ag business. Um, that's an area that we are very concerned about. You know, that the NSC, we're concerned about cyber business kind of writ large, but we're particularly concerned about it in terms of food ag because, again, so much of that infrastructure is in the private sector, which we don't control, and there is the, the opportunity for great mischief to those who wish to do us ill through uh, cyber attacks on our control systems, especially in the food ag uh, activity. So with that, I think I'm going to stop talking. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you all. That, that was wonderful. I really appreciate your insights. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I think what I'm going to do is just very briefly summarize a few th things that came out from the comments. We have uh, the breakouts this afternoon. I th hopefully we'll have an opportunity to explore some of the themes that, that arose in, in greater depth then, because I, I do not want the judges to hang me for keeping them from lunch. So. Um, the first thing, uh, Dennis's remarks, I, I was particularly struck actually that it, of all the systems, there are two that I think we have some recent experience with very disruptive crises uh, in those systems that might help us to think about what resilience actually means in, in, the, in a food system, to think about the, the lessons of the financial crisis and what we might garner from that in thinking about building resilience into the food system. Uh, Frank, your, your comments, uh, I was particularly struck by your remarks about the, the increasingly distributed produ production capacity of the energy grid, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about indoor cultivation of plants, thinking about the laboratory cultivation of proteins. You've all read about, you know, lab-grown beef and chicken. It seems like just a horrible thing in some ways, but I have this feeling that our grandchildren will probably n think it's appalling that we ate live animals, right? They'll be like, are you kidding? You, you killed pigs and then consumed them, right? So, th but th that kind of model of production, in some ways, this, it creates some opportunities to, to produce food maybe closer to where it's consumed um, on a smaller scale, and that I think has interesting parallels to what's currently happening. Uh, obviously, energy is way ahead there, but, but uh, Frank, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems like an undercurrent there is in the energy discussion for building resilience is that we need more, just more modes of production is helpful for, from a risk management standpoint, that we have kind of in some areas a monoculture of energy production that we're trying to push to in some ways a more resilient, almost like ecological approach. Just on that point, I think, I think that's exactly right. These new techniques, technologies, if you wish, what they allow us to do is have greater flexibility yeah in how we deliver that. So it's like, take an ecosystem, what is the most fit for purpose solution here, and apply it there. Yeah. 
and that's something new and that's something exciting that's being embraced yeah um then uh dustin in your remarks your comments about knowing the who the players are but also what their contextual behaviors are um you know, pe people f make choices about their about their food consumption. Uh, they also make choices about, uh, and Dennis, your your comment about making it runs. You know, and hoarding and profiteering. Um, thinking about the, the contextual behaviors that we might be able to influence, uh, or at least have plans. Uh, Dave, your your point about branches and sequels, to have some plans in place to think about how we could influence people's behaviors to prevent those kinds of events. When I was in graduate school in Boston, um, we, we had a major snowstorm and uh, the local Shaw's grocery store did not get food supplied for like 48 hours. It was completely cleaned out. I mean, it, it, with a 48 hour disruption. And the, uh, I don't know what the stats are, if any of you, you guys know, but the average American household does not really have a whole lot of resilience when it comes to losing immediate access to food, um, which became apparent in that event, you know, because fortunately I didn't have to, we, my, my wife was very good about this. You know, she always had like a couple of weeks worth of stuff. So we didn't have to run to the grocery store thinking that there wouldn't be food, but, um, and then uh, a, a final couple points on um, this question of uh, regulatory art, your, your point about regulation. Um, so, much of what it seems like the regulation, certainly CDC and the FDA, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with the USDA's regulatory philosophy, but much of that is very security oriented, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in your, with your background in public health, I'm curious whether the, you know, a lot of public health work is about resilience in the public health system. We, we tolerate, frankly, we tolerate disease. We, we, we count on the population to have a certain level of, of unhealthiness, right? That, but, but we're concerned about things rising you know, above a certain level. Ma so we manage, public health risk is, is epidemiological. It's, it's a little less medical in its, in its approach. And, I, and it, it is really, I think, resilience oriented in some ways. Now there are certain things we do not want, like E. coli contamination is a security issue with food. But if you think about cold season and the flu, that's more of a kind of resilience approach. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, uh, maybe in our later discussions, that exploring that kind of resilient, can you regulate resilience? Um, and then finally, you know, Dave, your, your comments on um, the private sector, you know, and, and the absolute necessity of, of working with the private sector and managing this issue, because uh, as you pointed out, um, the U.S. government doesn't sell food, really, you know, not to the American citizens. Um, and so its role, what, what can the government do in, in working with the private sector to uh, advance effective preparation for, for this, I think is, is really essential. So uh, panelists, thank you all very much for your participation and your comments. Um, and as I said, hopefully we'll, later we'll be able to explore these in greater detail. And thanks for your attention.